Right, everyone, I'm back. Sorry, it's been a little bit of a delay. Uh, been busy, actually. Uh, loads going on, loads getting planned for next year. Uh, not just what we're doing at Dirt Hub, but other projects like I do, like Team Green and Steel Hawk. But anyway, enough of that. Um, we're back with another man in the van. As you can see, episode 15, Ashton Dickinson. We're going to get him up on screen any minute now. But before we do that, as always, massive shout out to these guys, FXR, that help us and able to do this and these guys relax to race it's always a bit shiny the bottle in it um, before we go any further as well um doing a special little thing this week see this this is uh one of Dylan woodcock's old team green crash helmets bruised and battered bell these guys here are doing this let me just get up on screen actually let me remove myself So there you go. You can do that. Trade up. As I said, I'm not going to trade this one up. This is one a memento that uh, Woodcock gave me. But if you've got a bell, you can trade up. So find your local bell dealer and get that done. Right. That's all the advertisement and people that get involved make us do it out of the way. Thanks to you guys. Let's get the man up. He's sat there waiting. He's ready to go. Let's bring him in. Uh, Ashton Dickinson. There he is. Hello. Right. Ashton, um, I've got asked this, right? I, I'm going to go straight. I'm sure there's a fair few people out there that would probably feel the same. You've all got your circle of friends and whatever, you know. But for me, you know, you kind of, you, you've been around, but you came from sort of nowhere. So really, I, I mean, you really just arrived on the pro scene with a bang. It's like, okay, I've heard the name a bit, but. I can't remember you doing too much youth stuff and, and all that. So tell us about your background first and foremost. Let's find out more about how Ashton Dickinson got into got into motocross. Um, yeah, I did. I kind of just came out of nowhere. Everyone everyone always says that to you. You're right. So um, most of my amateur career was was in the states. You know, in the USA. Um, I just figured. I wasn't doing anything in England. I couldn't get any help anywhere. And I was pretty, I was pretty terrible as a kid. Like, honestly, I, I was like, no one would give me a second look, you know? Um, so basically we had this idea of, of going over stateside, um, a place called MTF, you know, Millsaps. Um, we've heard good things about her. So me and my brother went over, started training there. Um, and yeah, just kind of went with the flow. I think I was, I think I was like 11 when I first went over. And so, then, uh, okay, so you 11 when you went over, but you, you started riding in the UK. Because where are you from exactly? I know, uh, obviously, the great north-south divide. I'm a southerner. I virtually live on the Isle of Wight, as close oh. as you can get without living on it. Yeah. You're, you live up north. Whereabouts do you live up north? Without giving too much detail, so nobody comes and breaks into your house. I don't need yeah, your full north, address. Um, I'm from Leeds, so West Yorkshire, Leeds. Right. So... Did you start riding in the UK, obviously, before you went out? You you obviously did. You wouldn't just randomly go, I'm taking up motocross mm. and going to Millsaps facility. So how long are you, had you been riding at that point? I think I started riding when I was nine. So I was a bit of a, a late starter. Um, started on a, Kaw a Kawasaki uh, 65 back then. They were big old clunky things back then. But um, They were about the only bike in the class at that point. <laughs> yeah, literally. Um so no, I started back when I was nine. It was kind of like a, a family affair. We kind of we all liked motocross and stuff. And my dad got one, and then we he got all those of one. So started like that. Did a couple of like white rows, YMs, stuff like that. Um, never actually did the big ones, you know, like the red balls and all that stuff. So we never got a chance to because I wasn't good enough. You know, we knew we knew where we were on a on a on a level, so we want we want Red Bull. But but yeah. When you so. going back to what you said earlier, you said you you were you were terrible as a kid. You mean as a as a racer, or do you mean yeah. as a kid? No, I was a good kid. I've always been a good kid. Um, right. okay. As, as okay. a racer, I was like 
I was shocking. Like I'd get lapped at like every single race meeting, and it kind of, it kind of disheartens you a little bit. But I was only doing it for fun back then. Like like I still I still am, but like back then I, I did it for it were a family thing. You know. So what what changed that? I mean, what what suddenly if you were so terrible at it, there must have been an, an inner drive to to pack your bags and go over there. Obviously, you can't do that without family anyway and friends. But so what's what changed or, or did you just get so frustrated at being bad that, that it made you want to be good like you, you obviously have that inner belief then yeah i think i've always kind of had that little bit of belief in myself and my family have always believed in me a lot but honestly i think we just wanted to give it a go and see if it could make me better by going you know to these this big training facility um luckily i mean it paid off you know um but yeah, I think just hard work. Like I've I've always been a hard worker. When when I was there, I never had a day off. Even when I was sick, I was I was still out there riding, doing sections and motors, you know. So I think just all the hard work I've put in from being younger just it's actually paid off and it made me better. Well, it obviously has. So you went there when you were nine, did you say nine? Eleven. And how how many years did you do that? Just just the one, or did you go back and forth? Because at the first we we. Because of visa issues, we could only go like three months at a time. So yes. I, I first did a little, I did a little three monther, and then we ended up liking it a lot. So we applied for like another visa and all that crap. But I ended up being able to stay for for a few years then, and I stayed in, up until I think I was seventeen. I stayed up until I was seventeen. So I stayed there for a good few years. I did Loretta's, Minios, all that stuff. I mean, as a young kid, then. You know, I mean, going to going to America on holiday is cool. Yeah. But to, as a as a kid, going over there and doing that. I mean, for those that have done it, you know, and spent a considerable amount of time in in America and been involved with the American race scene, yeah. it it is a very different thing, and it's pretty darn cool. I mean, you must have felt like you was just like, well, just living the dream at that point. Oh, that's exactly what it is. You're living the literally. It's the American dream, isn't it? And that's what it's always like over there. MTF's a dream <laughs> man too. Yeah. You feel like anything. So when you, when, you, when you were there then, you know, so you, obviously you focused on the racing. So when did you initially start seeing the improvement? Obviously the Millsaps facility is amazing. Um, Clark, he was telling me about it. I know a few other people that have been there. Obviously Davey knows how to ride a bike and has his mum taught him and whatever. So I've heard it's pretty, can be pretty full on as well. So yeah. Just tell us more about that experience there and, and how long it kind of took to you starting noticing obvious results in your riding. How long did it sort of take to, to see that improvement? Yeah, MTF, it's it's honestly, it's one of them things as, as a racer, if you can go there, you really need to to go experience it. Just just everything they've got there, they've got the gym set up, they've got like three tracks, it's, it's amazing. Um, and like, my progression level i think i'd say like it took me a, a while to like a, a year down the line and then you're still looking at it like oh i still feel like i'm not getting any better and blah 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 but then all of a sudden you'll just keep doing your turn track you know and then you keep doing your sections everything like that and then it just it just comes out of nowhere you'll wake up one morning and you'll be putting down like three seconds a lot faster than than the kid that were beating you like the week before you know yeah. it's just it just happens overnight if you, if you actually keep working on it and working on it it just it happens so would you say then you know obviously like practice does make perfect but it's also the finer details that you just got to stick with it having lived through that experience now because clearly it's worked you know mm -hmm. like, like there's no being around the bush you know you, you've come back to the uk and now you're capable of winning pro motos and and pushing on now and, and winning a championship and mm -hmm. Some of your rivals watching this might disagree with that, but you are. You've got the speed and capability to do that going forward. So do you think, you know, that's that too many young riders, whatever, just want a quick fix too quickly on results? Yeah, I think a, a more, more people than not, you know, they think I, I've known a couple of kids that have, have gone to MTF and spent all the money on the bikes and the campers and all that. And they've only done it for like a couple of months and then gone, oh, well, my kid's not got any faster yet. Like, why ain't it happening? But it's not like that if, if it's up to the kid as well as it is the parents to put in the work and the money, you know. So it's all about how much hard work you want to put in for what you want to get out.
So I've got to see that is so profound. See, that's that's somebody talking sense. You can't you don't win races by having the biggest camper in the in the paddock, no. that's for sure. No, so putting the work in. So you obviously did put the work in. Now, um, I follow your brother Christopher as well on Facebook, so he's always entertaining. Yeah. That's cool. Um, and he's always battling your corner, uh, which is obviously great. What brothers do is he still out there? Or is um, he back? He's back, he's back, he's working, yeah. he's working at um with my dad now. Okay. But either way, so the whole family thing, and you know, and as I said, I don't really, I mean, this is the first time we've spoke straight up, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. I might have spoken to you a couple of times, just on the like little that. bits of chit-chat on it. Yeah, just like mostly, mostly asking you about our Rocket Till Sundown event, but I've never actually had a proper chat with you. So I'm glad we've saved it to now. So I'm getting to find out, like everybody else watching a little bit more yeah. about the real Ashton Dickinson. So when you was over there, now the mini O's and all that. I'm, I've never done Loretta's. I I am going to get to Loretta's one day. It's, it's it's on my bucket list. But I have done the mini O's. An amazing experience. Not raced it, but I've been there um, with Dylan actually and and a few others. A week long of racing. It's yeah. such a such a cool experience, isn't it? You know, just to, just to go and do that. How how did you run there? How did you go at the mini O's and Loretta's? Um. My last Loretta's actually was was probably my best one um, in 2016. I uh, I was doing 450B mod and college boy. Um, I think I got two podiums in college boy. No, in 450B, I got two podiums, um, so two second place. And then the last one, I had some um, I had some bike problems. I was running second, and then my bike I mean, bloody give out on me. So. Yeah. That, all right, you can swear. That's all right. Yeah, so my bike. Sponsors, as long as the sponsors are happy with it, I don't. I don't give a shit. Swear as much yeah, as you want. Yeah, that it. Um, but yeah, so my, that was my. That was probably my best finish. I wish I could have got um the overall, but I mean you can't help like yeah, you know. Um, and minios. To be honest, I've always had like minios. Always been like a go go go. And then last week, the last end of the week, it just I've always had bad luck, you know, and and, and always bend it in a corner and stuff, but. I think again, I've got a podium there in the 450B class too. So I've always been on the podium, just never, never won anything. Yeah. For I'm going to speak to you some more about Loretta's. Before I do, do you think the the style of racing in America now you're back in Europe and doing what you're doing over here in the UK? Do you reckon that style of racing has has helped you with with your raw speed? Because obviously there they don't have particularly at mini O's and things like that they're they're effectively sprint races like yeah. you know they're, they're just sort of four or five lap sprints and they are intense i mean the, the, yeah. you, they just absolutely they come off that gate from a young age they're taught to just absolutely hang it out none of this yeah. ease into the race stuff yeah. uh do you find that's helped quite a bit now you've come back to to europe yeah 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 100 percent. i think my first laps are quite are quite good you know i think that's where my my stronger part of it is in my starts and my, my first few laps. Um, so yeah, I think I think that has a lot. And then the, the track's not being nowhere near as rough. And you, you, my corner speed as well, you know, over there the corners are unreal. Like you get ruts that you can't believe. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, they're just obviously they they do things differently. Like I said, the tracks don't get so rough, but the ruts and stuff. And they still they still do stuff where they put like hay bales and stuff out in practice, yeah. don't they? To generate more lines and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, they do that they do that all the like the winter rounds. So like a gator back. Like you'll go out in one practice and then you go out in the other one. And there'll be like three air bales on the track, so pushing you out and you're just like, Whoa, what's yeah. happening here? Yeah. yeah. But it, it obviously it obviously works. Let's talk a little bit about your experiences at the Retters then, because that's a very different thing. What was the weather like when you've been there? Because obviously it's renowned for being um, ridiculously hot in Tennessee that yeah. time of year. But the, the overall ride, I mean, there's no bigger, other than the motocross of nations, but that's bigger in a different way. I mean, yeah. Loretta's is the biggest motocross event in the world. I mean, apparently, you know, speaking of Doc Wobb and whatever, you can be parked like, you know, look like nearly a mile and a half away from the bloody track. And there's all these people bombing about on golf carts. So what, what was that like as an experience? Honestly, it's the sickest thing ever as like a racer amateur racer is so much fun like both minios as well but i think the pinnacle is loretta's like you say um the racing super intense and stressful but once you do your motors you just jump on somebody's golf cart and you you're racing around like the the paddock and that and, and it like you say it goes for miles like it's unbelievable if you had to walk 
you'd be tossed. Like, <laughs> you won't get, get a race probably for, for the week, you know, it's that <laughs> big. But no, honestly, it's I meant to be anything from that. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, obviously, because they've got the river that runs through it and whatever, so it, it, it's just a, it's meant to be like, even when the race. Is open. No. Like, they have like, um, they, they have poisonous snakes in that river. Like, proper deadly snakes. And I think some kids have once been bitten by it, but really, I, I, I never went in it. I, I, I said, I don't like snakes. I never went in that. <laughs> That's Not probably a me. wise move. And yet they still have a load of kids swimming and d- jumping around in it. Yeah, um, yeah, I've got to get there sometimes. Uh, uh, Wobbs told me some fantastic stories of debauchery. So, you know, I'm not going there to race. So I'd be going there to, to get involved with that side of it and watch some good racing. I mean, that sounds like uh, I need to speak to Davey Coombs then, don't I, and see if we can try and start getting some um, British riders to get in. I know you've got to qualify for it. So did you qualify yeah. through your, obviously, in and around Millsaps area around there's, there's, um, there's regions in there, so like yeah. I think America split into like a bunch of different regions. And Cali, like California, is always known to be like the hardest region, so yeah. like you'll always find like the faster kids. Like when I was there, Pierce Brown was always over on that coast qualifying. Yeah. Um, but I did it like the east coast, I always did east coast, um, qualifying, and it's just a little bit easier. But yeah. that, that stuff, honestly, well, back back then anyway, it was the most stressful thing for me because I just thought if I don't qualify, I'm going to get the biggest roasting, like, <laughs> honestly. It's cool, though. I mean, a great day, obviously, that you know, you're not the first British rider to do it. A fair few have done it. But um, it's good that you've gone there and done it. It's definitely helped further your career. So, you know, so why why come back? What what was the was was you struggling? Was it not really working out over there, or you got homesick, or, or what? You know, because obviously America is a even tougher nut to crack because of the yeah. amount of traveling you got to do to do a national yeah. series. Uh, no, it wasn't actually a it wasn't actually a choice that we wanted. We we wanted to stay, um, but like I had I had some visa issues, um, so that meant right. I had to come. And I want I wasn't I wasn't legally allowed to be in the states so i yeah. had to come home and then when we did come home we went to uh, i think we we started at the service nationals funny enough because the british wouldn't let me race like they, they said we don't know who you are like you can't race you have to be like prove yourself as such so when we did that we did we did the um a service nationals did a couple of them then we did the british and just i think we just liked it you know it were it were a change of scene and 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 it was nice being home and seeing everybody. Yeah. I get to see all my family and my dogs, you know. So I think, no, it wasn't a choice that we wanted, but it were a choice that worked out for us. Yeah, so you got to roll with what's, what was handed to you. So that's, yeah, yeah I totally get It's good, obviously, you know, it's good being at home. And it's good when you've got dogs as well. So nice that's one it. on that. So what, you've come back to the UK, obviously, so now people like myself are starting to, find out a bit more about you and, and whatever and certainly over the last couple of years you've you know you've you've come on pretty quick as i said running to the sharp end and you know i mean how old are you now for, for, for i turned 22 in and this this month uh, Decent, this month. yeah 22 see still plenty plenty of plenty of time still a, a youngster i know a lot <laughs> of people are telling me i'm getting to my my peak end already I'm just like, I don't know about that. It's always a tough one. Obviously, you know, people they say from an EMX and GP point of view, you've got to be doing this at a certain age or whatever. But I think if you're good enough, you always find a way. And you, yeah. I know, I know he's a nine time world champion and, and you haven't won a world championship yet. But you know, you've got Caroli yeah. still going strong at 35. You had people yeah. like Josh Coppins coming good later on in his career. So I think, you know, you still got plenty of time ahead of you. So with that in mind, what uh, have, have you got a direct plan of where you want to be by a certain year or do you just do like let's just take one year at a time and see where we where we go with it um we, we obviously had like set things the beginning of this year and then covid happened and that kind of messed it up so I think <laughs> that's another statement it's, it's um beginning of this year we just wanted to gather as much experience as possible in in the gp scene and obviously we wanted to do we wanted to do bits in in the British, but that didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, so I think at the beginning of, of every year we assess how my year went, and and if we think I can do better, and 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 what I can improve on, and 
things like that. So yeah. So what was the plan for this year then? Because you you know you finished nineteen pr pretty str you know pretty strong. Like this, from, yeah. from what I remember, you took a took your sort of first British Pro Moto win yeah. um, at Ling, I think, wasn't it? Did you have one at Ling? Or was it before that? I can't remember. I don't even remember. You know. I remember you winning an MX Nationals MX Two. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Oh, that was at Ling. Yeah, that was at Ling. Yeah. yeah and then obviously you've done well at some of the, the the British rounds and stuff as well. So what with that in mind, then was your plan to go and do? I know you've done a few EMXs. Was your was your plan to do all the European ones, with the exception of the flyaways, or was it just cherry pick the ones you wanted to do? Well, yeah, because because of because of um, not being on a team and stuff, they they make it quite quite hard for you to get in to these yeah. races. So we had to like pick as many as possible. Like we had to do the Latvias and the Russias and that, and we wrote them all down. We were going to do them, everything except the flyaways. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we we wanted to do that basically at the beginning of this year. So, and you were still going to do, and what? And if the British was run, you was going to run that and selected MX Nationals, I guess. They yeah, didn't yeah. crash with the with the EMX. That's exactly right. We were going to do MXGP um, always. Like we were always going to do MX. We didn't want to because I've got I've got a really big problem with qualifying. Like <laughs> in America, I've never had to do it. You know, I've always just picked a peg or been yeah. told what get picked. So like, my qualifying sucks, man. So I've got to get on top of that for the next season. So that's that's why initially why we didn't want to do the EMX. Well, at least you're fronting up to to your weaknesses. Uh, again, some of your rivals are thinking, "Oh, that's good." So I don't have to worry about him in qualifying. But you know, well, some people yeah, there I might is have to work on it and come out strong next season. So we'll there is an art to it, yeah. But that's 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 actually quite unique because what we said earlier about how in America and you you come out of the gate and you just go for it. Yeah. And, you, and you said you're the start of a moto, you're blindingly quick, but then you can't seem to replicate that for I can't do it in qualifying. Honestly, I've been shouted at so many times by everybody. Like, well, you do it there, but you can't do it there. And I'm like, I just I just can't. It's just it's not in there yet. I haven't, I haven't figured it out yet. Well, that's gonna be interesting to watch and to see how you cope with that. So you're not so you're basically saying you're gonna bypass, well not bypass because going straight into MX2 as as a value, you know, if you're gonna pay the money. At least if you're going to do that and get in there to race, you get decent track time and you get yeah. two days of solid riding. And guaranteed, yes, don't we? Yeah, and guaranteed motos under your belt, which, of course, yeah. is, a, is a big thing. So so that's kind of cool. Now, you just touched on something there. You said about, you know, because you're not on a team. Now, is is that because you haven't find, found the right one or is it because you you prefer to do it as a family unit at this moment in time? Um, Kind of a bit of both, like, we haven't really found anyone that would want us yet or no one's showed any interest in us yet. Um, and and a lot of people have, have told me, like, I'm probably best doing what I'm doing right now. And just we're, we're trying to get a lot of outside help in, you know, to, to ease, ease it up on, on my dad's wallet, you know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, we haven't really found a team that, that wants us or anything yet, so. Because that's the key thing in it. Like at the minute, you're. I'm, I don't need to delve into that. How, how you finance and how you do it and whatever. Like you said, your dad's wallet's taken a hit. But you know, ultimately, you as a youngster, you know, and I do. You, I still very much categorise you as that. Sure. Um, you want to be earning a living from you know from what you're doing in it and putting all the hard work in and the risks involved. So I guess the key thing is is it's it's finding a, a moment, like a revenue stream to earn a wage, and you don't necessarily have to be on a team to do that. No, no, no. It is hard. Like, I mean, to be honest, I look at like you know, Ando and stuff, and and he's got so many sponsors that help him out, and it's not just Verdi, you know. So like, we when we first started doing it over in Europe, we we didn't have a clue. We were just doing it straight from Wayne, and he were buying my gear and buying my boots and everything yeah. like that. We never we never asked for help, you know. But we realised like it's gonna take a toll eventually. Like we need to start getting a little bit of support from some people. So I think this year was. The biggest year we had support at all really like ci sports they helped me a lot um malcolm rathmull and all them they give me boots and stuff and craigs i'm going so, to see i'm actually going to see mark chamberlain tomorrow so oh, yeah. i'm putting the good work anybody else watching look get behind that kid <laughs> um he's going places you know another british rider doing the gp so let's let's uh, let's see if we can get you some sponsors and get you out there well, out there doing it so Obviously, this year, as you said, a complete write-off. What have you been doing then? I mean, you know, you haven't been able to race or ride. So uh, have you just downed tools and thought, take a breather but keep physically fit? Or have you been trying to still keep the momentum going? 
No, I didn't. I didn't want to down tools completely at all because then then I'll just I lose all track of what I even need to be doing or where I'm supposed to be at. So I tried to keep the whole of lockdown. I, I kept my uh, fitness levels up. I was always out training and stuff. I couldn't ride, but yeah. I could run a bike ride and I could I could work out in the back garden and stuff. So I was trying to do that as much as I could. So what are you gonna? I mean, we've got another one coming up. So uh-huh. what? What have you been riding then since since we came out of lockdown? You've still been riding and just what going to practice venues up your way and just just, yeah. just doing what you can. Bloody, I've been smashing out Gale Common and Fat Cats. That's <laughs> them. I woke up that day. I live there. Uh, so yeah, no, I have. I've been. I think. I think when lockdown eased, we went. Me and my dad went straight to Belgium. Like we went straight to Lommel and Bergam and all that for like a week. Um. But yeah, other than that, I've just been uh, bloody Gale Common and that <laughs> every week. You need to. I see. Obviously, Casey Hurd, he used to ride for Team Green. He's, he gets up there quite a lot, doesn't he? He's back on a KTM two-stroke now. You need to. Maybe, maybe, hey, hey, maybe you know. You need to practice sprint laps together for qualifying or something. Yeah. Is he yeah. good at? Oh, C- Casey can hang it out for a lap. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 So you need somebody. Need a training partner. Yeah, legit. Yeah. So we're going to go into lockdown again. So obviously, that's going to kai boss that. As regards of twenty. Hold on, what year are you in? Yeah, I, I, I don't even want to remember 20. I keep forgetting. Forget the year. It's been such a write-off. Wow. 2021, um, still early days. And, of course, a lot of industry people are still sorting out their budgets or whatever. Yeah. Are, are, are you in a position where you kind of know what you're doing next year? Are you going to carry on doing your own your own thing at this stage? Yeah, I think so. we um, we should, like I say, we're not going to be on a team next year. It's just going to be our team again. You know, well, well, I think. We're trying to get some help from some new people and and yeah. how that goes. But we're like everybody at the minute. No one, no one really knows. We're running around like headless chicken trying to find out from everybody, you know. Yeah. That is. Well, as I said, hopefully a fair few people will see this and think, mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, obviously it's, it's not easy because I guess some businesses are going to have to be a lot yeah. more careful and, and look at where they where they put money and investment. But, um, you know, obviously we need to get the sport out there a little bit more. Now, you didn't race – um the British or, or the MX Nationals this year, because uh, obviously I guess you they clashed with some of the rounds you planned to do. Yeah. Um, you know, I ask a lot of guests on here about this from a, from a British motocross in general. You know, not not saying siding with any one series. Where where do you think it's at? Having ridden in America, having having ridden EMX and MX two and and whatever, you know. And you're out there trying to do your thing, and like you just said, get people behind you and back it. What What do you think? If we, if you could change one thing, for example, with British motocross to get more people outside the industry involved, what What do you think we should be doing? Sad, isn't it? There's a few things that's up at minute, but I'd say more, more. We need to push it more to get it on the on the on the TV. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So basically, like more content on. Yeah, Either YouTube or or pay per view things and stuff like that. Yeah, you've got to try and make it more appealing to the people that don't know. You yeah, because everyone, everyone grows up and they know what football is. They know who Cristiano Ronaldo is, and they know who Lewis Hamilton is F one. You know, mm. but our sports not out there enough. Like people, if you say motocross to them, sometimes they're like, "Oh, what's that?" So do you I think that's because obviously the sport is is so exciting to us, but we're in it? But do you think that's because the way it's it's filmed and also maybe we don't do enough to cover the characters in the sport. It, you yeah, know. I think so. I think a lot of that, yeah. I think that people focus on too much of just, like, the top three, you know, like, their their um, vision is just focused on them. Like, if you watch the MXGP, and I get, like, the front three are, are very fast and they're sometimes good to watch, but, like, you never see any other battles in, in the mid-pack and there's sometimes a lot <laughs> of good battles in, in, in the back, you know, so... People, people don't just want to watch the winner. You know, they no. want to see racing. They want to see people passing and taking out or, you know, aggressive and stuff like that. Yeah. I think that's what needs to happen a little bit. Like, you need to just start start branching out to, like, the kids that are, like, you know, actually doing some bits in the race. Yeah, because we've got a lot of a lot of people doing it in the UK and a, and a lot of talent. So, you know, I asked the question just because, obviously, I'm, I am regularly chat with the likes of Gareth Hockey, who's now doing – um, the British Championship, obviously, Paul and Neil Irwin, and I'm involved with the MX Nationals and stuff like that, and sort of running 
my own events a bit now and whatever i'm just trying it's always good to get a rider's opinion on what you know what we need to do to try and elevate elevate the sport in the uk but like certainly from your point of view as i said a 22 year old kid you know you need to call you a kid you're, you're a young man you know what i mean i can call i can call you a kid because i'm nearly 48 hey, yeah. Um, yeah we we need we need more characters and more you know people like yourself getting out there and trying to make it make it happen so what realistically then going into next year i know there's so much stuff up in the air at the minute we don't know where when the gp series is going to start if it's going to run where we're at in the world with covid or whatever if things go back to some kind of normality as in they do get to run a full gp season um at without these having like three three rounds at one event type thing um what would you you know have you got any expectation going in or is it just going to be this year's being put on hold and you'll be back to just getting out there trying to gain some experience and not put too much pressure on yourself no i think um i like i like having a bit of pressure on me i think it's it's good it makes you work harder um for next season i kind of want i want to build on what i've done this season you know i got a lot of i got quite a few races in the mhtp now and you know I have got quite a good good amount of experience doing them. So I think next year I wanna actually just I wanna be in the points all the time, not just oh he's got in the points that week and all that. I wanna be a, a, a good like easy top twenty rider, you know, top fifteen if if I work hard enough. So Yeah. I like what... that. See that's I don't know if that's I think it's a bit of both. That's you as a character, but also that's also been drummed into you at the Millsap facility as well. Maybe, you know, I love the fact that you, you say, no, I, I like pressure. You need, you, yeah. sometimes you need it to crack on, don't you? hundred percent. I, if I'd like to say, I've, I've had a lot of bad qualities this year and, and, and after the quality, I'm always like head down and then I'll get on the, I'll get a bloody phone call from my dad saying like, what are you doing? Like pull your finger out. Like if you do that in the race, like it's done. Do you know what I mean? So like a little bit of like, it's almost like a backhander, you know, like get going. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You know, I like that stuff. It, it, you need that stuff as a person. It gives you a kick up ass. I love the fact that you just rolled out the term a backhander. I, th I thought that term was long gone in a modern society. Uh, certain a certain age demographic will love that. Term. Yeah, you need a, what you need is a good old backhander, um, metaphorically, of course. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, sometimes sometimes you need one <laughs> that's brilliant um so listen it sounds like you know you've got hopefully time on your hands you know as in going forward if you're only only 22 and it sounds like you know you're sort of moving in the right direction as i said that's not sit here and blowing smoke up your ass but you know you you've effectively as i said sort of come from nowhere to a lot of us in the uk sure there's there have been people that knew you i wasn't one of them I'd heard your name, but I hadn't really followed you. And then, boom, you know, you, you come into the British and you've got this, this real speed and, and now it's starting to come together with, obviously, the results as well. So, you know, you uh, it's just a shame, as it has been for all of us, that, that COVID come along yeah. and it's just kind of put it on hold. So, But you're still looking and sounding pretty confident about, you know, what you're going to be capable of doing next year. That's it. I want to, I want to, I want to always, you always want to bet yourself every year, don't you? So, hopefully, hopefully next season it starts better than this season did you know none of this hooks whatever's going on we don't know what it is <laughs> oh, this is all gone there's no more masks and no more restrictions and we can just go racing yeah you know. that'd be cool well I, listen i i'm obviously looking forward to getting back to racing but i think you definitely bring something uh to british motocross there's no doubt about it you can you everything you've said there shows when you when you get on a bike you know that's how i first sort of started noticing it wasn't the fact it was just your, your real kind of speed and the way you went you went at it you know and yeah. took a few risks and i like that because that's everything i'm i'm not so i always admire that in people i was i was sort of steady as you go you know i, I, I yeah so i like it when riders get a little bit leery yeah yeah i like that yeah i have a bit of an angry side i try to control it as much as i can but sometimes it's not easy no nah. and from a from a commentator's point of view when i get to that you know we we need we need riders like that it makes the race so more exciting yeah um, i make it even more exciting from now on yeah Which but, you know is that maybe maybe why that's you know partly why you get bad qualifying results so you can make it difficult for yourself straight from the yeah, get-go. I, I do, you know, I try and make it good for good commentating. 
<laughs> well, you can get to work on polishing up those qualifying laps. So if you're anywhere up north this year and you're seeing uh, Ashton tearing around, you know that he's um trying to lay down these, get good at these qualifying laps. Yeah, just move out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, mate, again, thanks so much for doing this at such short notice. Um, that's my thought, really. I was meant to get hold of you last week and didn't. And then I put the pressure on. Um, it's been really good chatting to you and getting to know you a bit more. Um, I look forward to talking to you more at the races. And, mate, seriously, wish you the best of luck with it. Um, and I really do hope that a few people do come on board and get behind you because clearly, um, you know, you've got the focus and determination to get there. Yeah. And from a British perspective, we'll always be welcome and happy to see more riders in MX2 um, out there doing it. So that would be cool. Uh, and I wish you the best of luck. Whatever happens over these next four weeks or so, um, stay safe, do whatever you got to do. I, I, I don't know. But, and then hopefully, uh, as I said, we'll be catching up with you um, possibly at the first, second or whatever, or uh, GP or British next year. You know, I'm going to try to get to a couple of GPs more next year. So maybe we can catch up with you there. But in the yeah. meantime, thanks for bringing us up to speed with how you um, fell into this gig. Yeah. Uh, just before we go, are you like? Do you reckon you'll ever like um, want to go back to America at some point and give it another go in your career? Oh, yeah, a hundred percent. I think from where I was in when I left America to where I am now, I think I could do quite quite well over there now. You know, I see a lot of kids. I know a lot of kids that are doing the nationals and stuff over in in America. So I think. Definitely. If I can get back over there, I'm going to try. That'd be cool. Yeah. I'd like that. Well, you got time, as I said, mate. Yeah, crack on. You know, what you need to be doing is going over there, you know, as a, as a British champion or, or a top yeah. MX2 GP rider or something. I guess that's the target. Yeah, that's 100%. That's, that's the target. Well, it certainly sounds like you're not shirking any uh, responsibility up from your point of putting all your hard work in. So keep it up. And um, as I said, thanks for talking to us. And, uh, I'll, I'll catch up with you soon. Yeah. Nice one. Cheers. Right. Bye bye. See ya. Cheers, Ash. And I'll get and so Ash will leave. Now there he goes. All the best, mate. Nice one. So there we go. That was Ashton talking. Now remember before we go, before I go, um, here we go. Trade up. No, trade up to Bell. I'll just put the uh the thing up one more time. Bear with me. Gotta do a bit of jiggery pokery here. There you go. Um, trade up. You gotta find your local Bell dealer um you could you can find just go on the website uk website and you can trade up you can trade in your old crash helmet bruised and battered as much as it is and uh and then you'll get a 20 percent off your new bell helmet as i said i'm not going to get rid of this one this is this sits in my office but uh trade up your bell no matter which one it is to another new bell and get 20 percent off that's it and also once again thanks to these guys fxr and relax the race for getting behind what we do. There we go. That was episode 15, series two of Man in the Van. Um, we're going to be bringing you loads more now throughout the winter. Try and keep um, everybody into the sport when there's not much going on. Got a few good names lined up coming at you to finish off this year's series. And I'll be coming at you again soon uh, with another Dirty Talk show, live interaction show uh, on Facebook and YouTube, where you can obviously fire questions over to me and our guests. Right. That's it. Everybody stay safe in this uh, next four weeks. Uh, lockdown. Don't try and go too insane. I hope you've all bulk bought with toilet roll. If you have, what's wrong with you? Um, unless you've got diarrhea, that's not a good way to end the show. But anyway, stay safe uh, in the next four weeks or so. Hopefully we'll get through all this together. And uh, whatever we do this week, uh, stay positive. I'm sure we'll all be racing in 2021. Right. That's me out of here. Um, Tell you, everybody. I'll see you soon. No, I'm gone yet.